Okay, hello everyone. It's great to have you here today in the second INTF webinar. I'm really happy that we are kind of going to discuss about lots of really interesting things today. So let's just start to, to get sure that we would be on time. It's 9 to a.m. In, in central time. And I'm, I'm sure that people from Europe, they are, they are in their kind of sort of late afternoon. And uh, let's just start uh, with asking people to introduce themselves. And then we will move forward and discuss about things that we are going to have today. So my name is Hamed Ektiari, and I'm uh, Associate Investigator at Laureate Institute for Brain Research, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Kave. I'm Kava Shanae, University of Tulsa. I'm an electrical engineer, and I, uh, I'm also the department head over here. OK. George. Hi, my name is George Almeida. I'm an associate professor at the uh, University of Coimbra, uh, faculty of psychology. Um, that's about it. Great, Jenny. Hi, um, my name is Haya Akhad. I'm a PhD fellow at UCL. Uh, supervised by Jenny, so I'm just attending as a proxy. And we've got uh, Ainsley as well, and I'm also also near UCL. Awesome, That's good. Amazing. Welcome. Daria. Hi, I'm Daria. I live in Kaisman, Germany, together with Agnes Kuhl, and we work on uh, TDCS and aging and cognitive training. And I will also talk about this tomorrow. Good. Florian. Hi, yeah, my name is Florian Kasten. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Oldenburg, um, and I work with uh, Professor Dr. Hermann, and we're mostly working on TACS and TACS in, in neuroimaging. Good. Bernard? Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Dan, my name is Dan Azim. I'm a neurologist, and um, I have a research group at the Max Planck Institute of Human Cognitive and Brain Science and Sciences in Leipzig, Germany. Where we investigated uh, investigate mechanisms subserving um, neurological recovery, motor recovery, and also motor learning. Zainab. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Zainab Asmaifu. I'm a PhD student with Mount Dixon at Central College of New York. Adam. I'm Adam Woods. Uh, I'm an associate professor of clinical health psychology at the University of Florida. We focus on looking at transferring electrical stimulation in and out relative to treatment of age-related cognitive disorders. Lucia. Hi, um, everyone. Lovely to be here. I'm Lucia. Um, I'm at Imperial College London. I'm a neurologist. I work mostly in multimodal imaging with TPCS and interested in integral variability, brain injury, rehabilitation, um, particularly in the cognition and psychiatry field. Sure. Catherine. Yeah. Catherine, could you, could you hear us? OK, sorry. I wasn't sure it was me. Um, I'm Catherine Stubick. I'm at American University. I'm an associate in psychology and neuroscience. Um, and we focus on uh, or TDCS in uh, a few different clinical disorders combined with functional imaging. Okay. Josef. Hello. My name is Jose. I'm working in Nagoya Institute of Technology, Japan. We are working in the computational modeling for EMS and TDCS. And also now we are working in nerve model. Good. Fluel. Yes, um, my name is Agnes Schlül. I'm at the University of Greifswald in Germany, and um, I'm a neurologist, a neuroscientist interested in neuron basis brain stimulation, dementia, and stroke rehabilitation. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Eva. I'm from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, and our group part here is working on cognition and plasticity, especially plastic effects of neuron basis brain stimulation. Awesome. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Nicola Kandarin. And uh, as from next week, I will be a postdoc at the Group of Neural and Environmental Readings with uh, Molly Henry at the MPI Peripheral Aesthetics. And I'm mainly interested in using TACS to modulate perception and uh, using also brain imaging and computer modeling to improve our simulation paradigms. Awesome. Gazzales. 
Good. Johannes. Hello, I am Johannes Voskuhl. I am a postdoctoral researcher also in Christoph Hermann's lab. Um, I did some work on uh, TACS um, fMRI and recently we've been doing um, a project on the combination of TACS with MR spectroscopy. Maro. Hi, uh, my name is Maron Dixon. Along with Zainab, I work at the City College of New York. And we've done a lot of work on computational modeling, and we are uh, very interested in how to integrate that with uh, functional imaging. Alexander. Um, hi, I'm Alex Opet, uh, assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, my lab works a lot, I'd like, say, computational modeling. Also interested a lot now um, what happens in the brain during brain stimulation and physiology. Um, and also, I um, just want to, if I can say that I'm also recruiting postdocs at the moment, pretty much about the topic of that um, seminar. So if anyone's interested, yeah, write me an email. Great, awesome. So we still have others online, something like 33 attendees so far. So if there is anybody else that we do not have uh, his or her camera uh, kind of online, he or she could 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 introduce uh, himself. Axel, would you would you introduce yourself as well? Axel, we cannot hear you. Your your mic is not on, Axel. Now better. Yes, we can hear you really well. Oh. Yeah. Well, so my name is Axel Kirchner. I'm working at the Institute Center for Magnetic. Magnetic resonance, and also at the Danish Technical University, I've done a lot of computational modeling with my group. Uh, we are also very interested in, in seeing how um, basically biophysical predictions, uh, field predictions, link to um, neuro, uh, neurophysiological measures of S and S. So, uh, neuroimaging is obviously one of the measures. Um, Good. Duke. Hello. Hello. Hi. Duke, would you introduce oh, yeah, yourself? I'm just, sorry, I've just joined late. Duke, could you introduce yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. I'm Duke Shreen. I'm at the city. University of New York, um, where I direct our MRI facility and have doing work with combining TDCS and fMRI in a um, safe and reliable manner. Good. Makoto? Hi, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Makoto Uzik. I'm a postdoc researcher uh, in the School of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of St. Andrew. I'm interested in the neuroassociation and the cross speaking happening. Great. Anybody else that would uh, be kind of introducing uh, why are they just uh, the, the, the mic? Uh, hello? Hello? Hi. Um, I'm sorry, I just joined a little bit late. Um, my name is Maria Ironside, um, and I'm at McCain Hospital, and I study um, TDCS and depression using um, the behavioral and functional imaging. Welcome, Maria. Anybody else who would like to introduce? Um, yes, I'm also a little bit late. So my name is Daniel Kuzer from Munich, from the University of Bavaria, Munich. And we are also doing a lot of uh, multimodal and neuroimaging combined with systems. Well, anybody else? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is uh, Alpenga. I'm a postdoc with uh, Dr. Woods at the University of Florida. Anybody else?
Okay, let's let's start. So today we are going to basically this is the second INTF webinar that we have. In the first INTF webinar, we discussed about challenges for for doing TES fMRI studies, and we have we received lots of really nice feedbacks from people in terms of the good discussions that we had together. And uh, we explored really great potentials to see how we can do joint collaborations and how we can share protocols. So it seems that there are many interesting things that we can do, do together. So we are planning to do uh, webinars every something like three months. So the next one would be in late September. It would be on, I think, the September 26th. So we will kind of inform you about the, the third one. In this one, in the, the second webinar, we are going to be mainly focused on the computational head modeling and functional brain imaging, how we can combine these two modalities together. And we know that we have variations in response in TES. I mean, those who are doing TES studies, they know that the, the variation is significant among different individuals, and even we have intra-individual variations. And the question is, okay, how we might be able to predict that inter and intra-individual variation using different types of data that we have. And there are discussions in terms of what are the sources of these variations. And we know that potentially brain structure is one of the major sources of variation among different uh, subjects and participants. And the question is, okay, how much computational head modeling could be a, a predictor for a good source of trait-based variation? And then we have also ideas in terms of, okay, it seems that brain function could also be a source of variation. And then we are exploring whether fMRI could be a, a tool to help us to uh, get into the, that, that, that source of variation and see how we might be able to use that. And the, then the question would be, okay, how to combine computational model and, and fMRI? And you know there are lots of challenges in terms of, okay, how we are going to integrate data. What are the potentials for data fusion? What are the modeling things that we can do for that? And then... There are challenges in terms of the scale of the integration and the space of integration. So there are many things that we will discuss today about. And then there, there might be interesting things in terms of how we might be able to collaborate. And is there any chance that we can share the pipelines that people in different labs they are doing in terms of the combination of computational head modeling and fMRI? And is there any potential for data sharing? And I've heard frequently from different colleagues who are doing TES fMRI but they do not do computation head, computation head modeling, and they are interested to share the data that they have collected so far to see if we can combine that with computation head modeling. So I think that there are definitely interesting potentials for, for collaboration. So today we'll have different speakers from, from New York, from, from Denmark, from Germany, and I hope that these discussions would, start, would be a good starting point within the INTF uh, network to establish a collaboration for... Uh, future activities. But other than that, we are also moving forward to see how we might be able to put together few consensus papers. And based on what we have been discussing from the last session and the last webinar, right now we are working with uh, Duke and Ines in terms of how we might be able to provide a, a checklist for those who are interested to do online fMRI TES study, so doing TES inside the scanner. And do, could you just introduce the idea of what we are going to do and the things that we are going to kind of uh, present in the checklist? Duke? Yes. So, uh, we, yeah, we discussed last week um, this checklist and uh, we're in the stages of putting it together, but it would probably, you know, some things that are very obvious to many in this um, webinar, um, and, but perhaps may not be obvious to people uh, who would like to start TCS, TCS uh, fMRI protocols. And so it's um, basically just a short checklist that we're going to expand upon that has to do with, you know, the, sort of the alterations from your regular TDCS outside the scanner setup versus in the scanner, you know, considerations about your electrodes, not to use sponges or saline solution, different recommendations for different types of gel or, um, you know, options that you may have. We had a lot of discussion last time 
about um, initial experiences that many of us had shared where our first scans were played with you know, RF artifacts because of the way that the cabling was going through the waveguide and the RF filters weren't really, you know, either weren't present or weren't doing the job. And so uh, many of you mentioned you know, having to learn the hard way to send the cabling through the penetration panel, not the waveguide using appropriate RF filters and how that solved a lot of the um, artifact issues. At the same time, I do re remember, I don't recall who mentioned um, that that might have been a difficult thing uh, in Europe for safety compliance, sending the cabling through the penetration panel instead of the waveguide, and that might be a topic for further discussion or elaboration because that, that was new news to me, and I think that's an important consideration. Um, and as well, you know, I, we would like to also um, throw this checklist out from just uh, straightforward hardware considerations that are simple but without having taken those precautions can result in large artifacts to also um, more sort of advanced MR acquisition design and post-processing strategies to sort of um, further mitigate the potential artifacts in the GTS MRI. Awesome. I will keep that back from everybody. That is, that is great. So we, we will kind of uh, start to share the initial draft with others who are doing TES, TES fMRI. And it, it's interesting that we already have 54 published online TES fMRI study. And it would be interesting to see what people have done so far and how what are the things that we might be able to consider in the future. And then, yeah, that would be nice to see how we can kind of move forward for that in a, in a collaborative way. And meanwhile, uh, Ines Violante, Dr. Violante, are you online right now? I cannot see you online. Ines is working on the other side of the checklist, which is basically uh, about the, the cognitive neuroscience of the checklist. So Duke is mainly focused to the, let's say, physics part of the, the checklist, how we are going to do that. And Ines is, is working right now on the cognitive neuroscience part of that. Okay, what are the things that we can do when we put something inside the scanner? inside the combination of, let's say, fMRI task and uh, stimulation, what are the things that we can consider and what are the challenges that you will face in terms of doing the, the stimulation inside the uh, scanner in terms of the cognitive neuroscience uh, issue. So that will be another part of the checklist and we'll just kind of share that checklist with you guys as well to see how your feedback. And we are hopeful to be able to put that out as something like an INTF consensus checklist to help people to kind of increase the quality of what they are doing and bring in potential for sharing the data together. That, that would be one of the things that we are moving forward for that. And meanwhile, we are hopeful to be able to have a sort of consensus paper from what we are discussing today in terms of the computational head modeling and fMRI. That would be another thing that we'll discuss, and that would be really nice to see how those things would be happening. The good thing is that right now, Marom and Zainab, they are, I mean, we are working on, on a, a paper that is hopefully would be published in terms of the integration. So they will discuss about what are the things that they have done so far and potentials for, for that integration. So let's go to the to the next speaker, Marom and Zainab. Marom, we are listening to your, your talk. Great. Um, so um, yeah, me and Zainab are gonna give this together. Um, Dana, are you gonna? Are you loading the slides up from your app, or? Yeah, yeah, I do. But the thing is, how I can share my slides? Do I Let me just. Uh, I will. I will give you the can screen. I share my screen. Yes, you will have that. Um, so while she, uh, Dana, blows it up, I'll just give a quick introduction. So. Uh, my lab has been doing, uh, and Zainab has been doing also a lot of computational modeling of current flow, so prediction of how current flow flows through the head during ECS. We're not going to talk about that uh, today, uh, but you know, we and other, you know, we've released open source software like Roche that allows everyone to do that. Um, Axel and Alex, who are on the call today, released other software called Sydnibs, uh that allows everyone now to do uh, current flow modeling. So we're not going to talk about that. We're actually going to focus on, on how to integrate these current flow models with functional imaging. And uh, this is something we've been thinking about for a couple of years now. Um, we've been working on this uh, with a few people on 
this just on this uh, webinar here, we've been working with Hamid, uh, Adam Woods, uh, and also do present my institution. And so um, what Zainab is really going to be talking about are our conceptual problems that we have encountered. So we're actually not presenting solutions. We are presenting problems uh, that we are trying to work through. And, and so really in the next, you know, 10 minutes, Zainab was really just going to try to go through a punch list of problems that we've had, and we hope that that promotes a discussion about how to address these problems. So uh, go ahead, Zainab. Um, okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, um, hello, everyone. First of all, um, as Mom said, I'll be talking about all the challenges that we've experienced throughout these uh, two or three years. As far as uh, combining the computational MLs with fMRI, which was and has been our motivation at the beginning. Uh, first of all, there is I mean, uh, there is no need to emphasize that there are uh, interindividual variables in the key concern to the field, and um, there are several studies have been published that I just brought some of them. This is not all of those that has been using. Uh, computational modeling to show that there is inter-individual vari variability as far as um, electric field uh, in use in the brain in the targeted areas. And uh, this is all for normal subjects. Of course, if you go to patient population, that's going to go to extreme, especially in the stroke and but other subjects. So here, I'm just, uh, it's just an introduction to say that um, this is one of an example to show that the intensity and the electric field distribution for each montage and also across different subjects is different. And even if uh, in the HD montages, that the whole promise is to reduce the distribution to uh, a specific one that is focal, they still have these differences in the intensity produced in different ranges, ranges across different individuals. So uh, now back to our question that how we can quantify the electric field in using the brain and regress it out in our experiments or in our clinical trials. Uh, then this question comes up that uh, what is the metric that we are going to use in order to uh, quantify the electric field? There are several metrics that we can use. Here I just listed some of them that it can be peak of the electric field in that specific ROI, that is the targeted area, it can be the median, it can be um, just some percentage or a specific threshold that has been set in that study. And also, as electric field is a, a vector, we can assume the magnitude of that as a metric or no, we can say the radio component or conventional are important factors. Uh, so now we have uh, a pool of metrics that we can pick from. And also, another issue is yeah, in talking about ROIs, how you can choose the ROI that you want to quantify the electric field in that. So, um, uh, as I said, it has, there are several other methods that you can use for choosing an ROI here. We use two different uh, methods just for the sake of comparison. The first one is just uh, an atlas based. Since our electrodes were on FDF4 by lateral DFC, uh, we wanted to segment all the areas that were exposed to electric field. So we segmented all the areas in the peripheral regions uh, based on the atlas and FSL. And also, another idea was why do we need functionally? Why not uh, segment it based on the specific threshold of the electric field distribution? So we segmented the areas over certain threshold that we need that all these areas are getting um, good enough electric field. And then in their study, the question was, is there any correlation between the electric field in the areas and also the amount of activation in those regions or not? There's a lot of uh, details in this slide, so uh, for the interest of time, I will just go through all the details. But um, here we chose uh, average electric field as a metric. And also, this is the atlas phase segmentation. Uh, the study was uh, some control crossover design. So as you can see, the, these blue dots are uh, corresponding to sham sessions, and the red ones are the active ones. And, um, 
and the active person was, is there any correlation between Dr. Field and the activation after TBCS compared to before? And as you can see here, the frontal pole has, is the only area that has this nice correlation with uh, electric field while the sham system doesn't have any correlation. And um, I've shown it on the, the down uh, right that the frontal pole is the area that is getting majority of the electric field, which is obvious. It's like change and it's pushing the field electrodes. Uh, but um, this was not the only way we could, we could have segment the areas. Uh, another example of that was uh, using it in the CAN code drive um, segmentation. Uh, in this one, we did the same thing, but now as you can see, there is um, no correlation in any of these areas, which is uh, surprising. And uh, I just, uh, by bringing up all these, all these challenges, I just wanted to say that we have chosen uh, two different methods to, to, to select the ROI and we ended up having two different results, uh, which means that all these decisions of how you're quantifying that and when you're quantifying these things matters when you're doing the, uh, the study. Um, and by the way, we also think if you chose your electric field differently, so instead of average, you choose median, you're going to get different stats. If you choose peak, you're going to get different stats. So these things, radial versus magnitude. So we haven't tested it, but we're strongly suspicious that depending on how you pick that as well, you're going to see, you're going to get some very divergent conclusions. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, yeah, another point that I wanted to make here was is uh, by now acknowledging the fact that anatomical differences is a potential source of variability, and in all the clinical trials, we want to somehow take it out of, or take it out of the variation and explain why it is. Uh, there are two potential ways that we can do that. The one is the retrospective way that everyone gets the same dose, let's say one million for all the subjects, and after the study is done, we can go back and do the modeling and calculate how much electric field was each person receiving, and then calculate this as a um, as a regressor in the study. And also, another way is like the prospective way that each person can get a different parent, which uh, is based on the modeling is guaranteed to produce the same amount of electric field in the targeted area in the brain. Uh, each of these approaches would have, um, I guess, the first one is the easier one. But each of the approaches has their own underlying assumptions, which now we are going to talk about. Um, the retrospective uh, way to regress out the anatomical differences has these assumptions of the linearity of this monotonicity and the polarity to dependent of the dose response, meaning that if there is uh, an increase in intensity in some subjects, there is uh, an enhancement in the outcome. And um, in the prospective way, there is the only assumption that we're making is that the single number of liquid could be produced in average in that ROI, which we don't know that yet because anatomical differences is not the only source of that. But let's go back to the retrospective way that um, the assumption is is big. So. Um, Based on what we have in the literature, um, I know this is a little bit complicated. Let me just zoom in. Based on the um, physics of TDCS, uh, we know that um, there is this linearity that is decayed in the physics of TDCS. So we know that if you increase the amount of current delivered to the electrode, uh, you would end up having uh, increased electric field in the uh, brain. So here I'm showing the anodal and cathode uh, of M1, SO1, HD electrodes, uh, showing 1 milliamp and 2 milliamp for all of them. And uh, if the 1 milliamp is producing X amount of electric field in the brain, uh, doubling it to 2 milliamp would uh, make, make the electric field in the brain area double. And this electric field is producing the membrane polarization in that area. 
So uh, based on what we have in the literature, we in vitro a slice of the animal models and also the in vitro of animal models, we know that um, there is this good, in, good evidence of linearity of the polarization based on the electric field. But uh, of course, we know that those experiments are the electric field is fully uniform, and also there is high intensity of the electric field in there. But still, at least linearity is somehow consistent here. But from the membrane polarization, if we go to the many studies in the PCS, then the story is going to be complex and different. So uh, from the membrane polarization, let's say the electric field produced by TBCS is going to change the membrane polarization and then increase excitability, synaptic efficacy, and um, synaptic plasticity, and then cause network enhanced network activity and ultimately cognition and behavior. But in the literature over these uh, two decades, we don't have the evidence showing that increasing the intensity necessarily means enhancing the effects. Even so, not only we don't have that evidence, we have some, some evidence showing that that assumption doesn't hold, meaning that if we increase the electric field, the current intensity from one milliamp to two does not necessarily enhance the effects. Uh, so now there is questions of is more current more or not? Uh, based on what we have in the field right now, we cannot make any conclusion. Uh, and that, that assumptions of the linearity when we want to uh, account for, control for the effects of uh, um, anatomical differences is still is under question. So I just wanted to raise this question that this, this assumption is a huge one and we should be cautious about it. And Another one that, that we were so interested from the very beginning was that um, they were doing, they wanted to com uh, combine fMRI with TBCS and computational modeling. So the idea was uh, they were doing pre and post. So we know that uh, anatomical differences is not the only source of variability. We wanted, uh, we know that the state dependency of TBCS is another important factor. So, uh, so the question was how we are going to combine the state dependency of TBCS and also account for the um, anatomical differences. So we ended up uh, uh, asking this question with all the maps of the state of the brain before TBCS and the um, map of electric field during TBCS, asking this question that uh, there are these two variables can explain the variability in the outcomes uh, or not. And because it was a task-based one, we didn't go to the functional connectivity and all the other stuff. But of course, for the other uh, imaging protocols, definitely there are different methods to, to, to look at the baseline. But uh, another issue, I mean, that's the last one, but another issue that we came across was uh, when we are comparing these two um, maps together, even like in ROI base or in a voxel base, um, the assumption that we are making is that each region is isolated and not connected. Why do we know that they are all connected and all the neighboring areas are exposed to electric field? So probably this would elaborate that topic a little bit. But knowing the fact that these brain areas are interconnected and all the regions between the two electrodes are stimulated, in our case it was, uh, then we cannot go ahead and ask this question and not consider this fact that these areas all are going to affect on the effect of the region of interest that I'm taking. So probably the solution would be not a definite solution, would be using some montages that are more focal, but at least we can control for the electric field in that specific area and ensure that some other ROIs that we know that has correlation or connection with our region of interest are not exposed to electric field. 
or from depending from our analysis methods, such as um, unaffiliated ones that we can account for them the the cities and additional under the set that out. If, you know, if what Zainab sounds a little bit overwhelming, it's because it was overwhelming to us, right? First, first, you know, you're thinking, is the electric field in your ROI correlated with the change in the ROI? And we don't know that. And then on top of that, it's, it could be 100% state dependent. So given electric field and a given ROI, what it does may be entirely dependent on the baseline state of that ROI. And we don't know that dependency. And then on top of that, most montages, like the M1SO montage, are, are stimulating most of the brain. And so now you have all your you know, hundreds of ROIs, each with a different electric field, each with a different state, and each one communicating with each other ROI. And um, we really, you know, got up to our neck sort of in, in, in this, and we, we didn't, we, we don't have a proposal for how to simply address this, but we're just trying to show you the the problem that we're struggling with. And, and when you're using a focal montage, like the four by one, you, you can remove some of these issues, but, but um, certainly not all of them. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Marom and Zainab. It was a, a really, really nice presentation showing the, the challenges that we are facing in the field and the, the many things that we are supposed to think about in the next 30, 40 years of our career, so seeing how we might be able to do some interesting things inside. So we will have time in the, in the kind of the last part of the webinar to discuss, so please keep your questions written and just we will discuss about those questions in details and how we might be able to kind of figure it out, how we might be able to collaborate. So let's, let's move forward to the, to the next speaker. The next speaker, Axel, Axel Dr. Tischler from Technical University of Denmark. Axel, please. Let me just give you the, the screen so you will have the control for a screen. Just, just a second. Sorry, I'm simultaneously doing 10 different tasks together, so sometimes it gets, gets complex. So, okay. Excellent. Can you can share your screen right now? Can you? I'll try. Now it should work, right? Yes. Wonderful. So, let's let me get started here. Sorry for the hack here. Uh huh. I don't know how to get that now working. Oh, I think here. Would that be fine? Yes, we are seeing that and we are seeing you and your voice really well. So that is good. That's great. Okay, and you see, you see my screen. So, wonderful. Let's get started. So, um, I was invited to talk about our computational closing screen and MRI can inform each other. And, and I think um, um, I decided to not really talk about that because the two reasons. Um, first of all, I think the best way is to combine the two things still have to be determined, and that's exactly uh, um, what, what Marum was, for example, talking about. And um, the second reason is that, that there will be a second um, on presenter, which is Daria Antonenko. Um, she will give a recent example then on how we try to approach it. So I thought it's also useful that, that one talk is more uh, on the, um, focused on some hands-on methodological aspects that I think are just relevant to ensure a good quality for the comparison. So I'll just briefly cover on four aspects here, namely um, both um, the, the, the tools which have been mentioned already by Marum, like Rose or, or Simlips. Well, they, are, they give you automatic segmentation, but actually the automatic segmentation, they really depend a lot on the input images, whether they're good or not. So I'll briefly cover that. I'll also talk about the energy loss I think it's, it's really important also to take into account and also to the to, conclusions. Then uh, there will be some overlap in the sense that I'll talk about the measures to expect um, of the simulation results, so there will be some overlap with the talk tomorrow. And I'll just um, um, round off the graphics. 
well, let me first come, come to this um, um, thing about um, automatic segmentation. So what you see here is a brain segmented out from a C1 scan of a typical C1 scan of a, of a subject. And um, we scan this person several times, so three times, so this is the first scan. And here we change the parameters of the MR scanner a little bit, so as you could see, more or less the same, a small change. And another small change, a third scan of the same subjects, not not big difference, right? I hope that you are here. So, uh, but the mask out to now the, the extra uh, non-brain tissue, so let's do the same thing again with, with non-brain tissue. So this is the first scan, this is the second scan, and it's just a small change, it doesn't affect really the contrast in the brain, but it affects the contrast of the non-brain the non -brain tissue. And this will be then the third scan. As you see, there is some, some apparent movement going on here, which is just uh, an art called headship. So the question is a little bit how does that now affect really the segmentation accuracy of the automatic tools which we have. And so far we have SCAN-12 as a standard thing um, which we use to automatically segment it. So what we did here is, here on the left, you see the segmentation result from SCAN-12. When one of the C1 scans was actually combined with a C2 image, as shown here, so it's a multi-contrast segmentation, and, and here on the, on the right side, what you see is the C2 scan of the same subject. Yellow would be the complex bone, and, and the reddish here is the complex bone. And in general, you see that there's a quite nice correspondence, I would, would say, so the, the quality is really nice, there's not much so let's see how that changes when we only give a T-bone as input. So this is the first T-bone which we had. And you see already that part of the skull is missing. This is the second T-bone which we had. There you see that more of the skull is missing. And the same subject again, the third um, scan, and here you see another part of the skull. Is missing. So it seems to be a little bit stochastic when you only have a T-bone as input. Um, what you get as a as the segmentation result for the skull out is just for robust. And how does it affect now the field simulation? So this is again simulation with the proper skull model, I would say. Um, to communicate that for this kind of unfocal montage, you have some simulation here of the region which you intend to have, but you also have strong fields here in other regions. This changes um, quite a bit when you now have um, the one scan with um, other segmented facility. So here you still have strong fields. In the target region, it changed a little bit, but also here in that region, it became really weak. It changes even more for that scan, and then you can say just go on with the game, and you can go back to this. So they're all changes, and they're just um, caused by that the segmentation is incorrect, and you only have to go on. Um, the scan is incorrect. And it's a little bit stochastic. So this is from, from one of our studies that we assessed it a little bit more in, in, in um, systematically. Uh, in general, what we see is that when we have a C2 scan in the segmentation with SKM, then the, um, the so here dice coefficient is just means when it's higher, the better. And you see that it's for all different methods, it's relatively stable once you have a C2 um, scan in. And this changes really once you have only a C1 image as input. Where some, uh, some subjects really work out nicely, have a quite accurate skull segmentation, but this, the others is really failing. So this just means that, um, to sum up that part, is that so far when you have head modeling and you base this head modeling on SM12 segmentation, which both goes and similar to so far, um, it, you cannot just, uh, can expect it to be robust non brain tissue. And it will just add a stochastic component to the two simulation results. And I think this will potentially also then inflate the inter-individual differences which we So as as one thing to, to avoid that is that well I really recommend that you add a C2 scan um, to, to your um, imaging protocol and that you also pilot your sequences um, and obviously check to set the quality of the automatic segmentation as a standard procedure and edit it to this. And if you do that, um, you should really expect some manual workload when you only have to one images. I'd also like to mention that the, Im the, the images which I showed now were just actually of good quality, research scan quality, and be really good when you have to use it. So um, I think 
think it's really relevant because otherwise we, we um, see a lot of inter-individual differences in the field, but they are just coming from some stochastic performance of the Another thing I'd like to mention is, uh, uh, or go into, is the electrical properties of position. So what is often used is to throw large head electrodes, and um, I mean this, this actually this very traditional image here shows it quite nicely. So when you add a large head electrode on the skin, it doesn't mean that it really um, connects to the skin in a very homogeneous way, right? So you have strong varying contact and sequences with some of the edges maybe not connecting at all, so, and some parts are really very well connected and so on. So this is this is really adding some variability in how the current can enter the skin. And this variability is really hard to control for practically and might actually contribute to the individual variability in the simulation outcome, even though we, we don't really notice it because we don't have a good way of controlling it. And obviously when you simulate this we normally simulate um, ideal electrodes, so you cannot really take that into account, meaning that uh, also this is a potential source of uh, differences between the real field that you have and the simulated field. And for very large electrodes, what we also see is that, well, um, we not only have the fact that most turns try to flow uh, through the edges, basically, but we also have that you have to connect to the electrode somewhere. So, and underneath the connector, there's, there's, uh, there seems to be a really a stronger current entering the skin. And this is again some core example here on the right. Um, there, what I did is just change the position of the connector um, uh, of the red electrode from one time from the more inferior part to the superior position, it's from here in the black position. What you see here is that. Well, one time the red region here, this region of the, of the uh, brain is really stimulated strongly, and here it's still stimulated strongly, but far less. Uh, for the return electrode, which is a large electrode, you see that this frontal region here um, is one time stimulated to a moderate extent, and one time more or less not at all. So, also this adds some variability, which is actually, um, yeah, um, should. should be accounted for when, when, when aiming to really come to an expert model. Um, but I also, um, I'm a little bit an advocate of, of not uh, relying too much on large electrodes because they're really hard to control and track for. So um, one thing I'd like to bring up here is that, um, well, smaller circle electrodes with a connector in the center, as for example also used in, in force plus one montages, um, gives you much more control over where the, the um, currents really enter the skin and will, by that, already reduce the variability, the inter-individual inter variability that you have, and also ensure that uh, the current flow models will better predict the current. This obviously means that you also have to be accurate in the electrode positioning, because when you uh, just finally move the electrode, as shown by Alexander Opitz, um, this can already quite have quite substantial um, differences for the So I think these are two practically relevant things I'd like to uh, just bring up. Mm -hmm. Then I'm um, going more into um, a topic which, um, which overlaps with what Maram said, so basically what to report, what to expect. So one thing we are relatively sure about is that, well, it's, it's probably quite a gray matter which is of most interest for us. But then, as said, it's both few strengths which might be interesting and but also the local field orientation uh, relative to the neural target elements uh, metric. So, um, this is uh, in theory uh, all fine, but in fact, it's a little more difficult. Um, so, in TMS, it seems to be what we see so far that we really can just rely on the field strength as the first of approximation um, because the field strength is, is the dominant factor which really drives neural expectation. But even there, there are opposite hypotheses. And for, for electric stimulation, we thought that, well, the, that the normal field component, as already shown in the, in the prior part, uh, polarizes the tumor and also the identity speed of the cerebral cells. So maybe we should really predominantly look at the normal field component. But that's a hypothesis, right? So I think um, what we can do with this combination is really just um, take it from our historical um, position and say, well, we should really, instead of 
um, trying to make strong conclusions in advance and um, on, on what to analyze, we should really in a first round try to see if what parameters like field strength or normal essential components really um, give us the best fit to our, our FMI results and then try to explore in a second step why that is the case. Uh, that's just a point example here to illustrate that. So these are two montages as you see in the, in the upper part here, a four plus one and a bipolar montage, which I intentionally designed so that they give similar field strength distribution. They show, uh, but actually, the both hit multicortex relatively strongly. But obviously, as you might already expect, the current flow distributions are very, very different, right? So in the, in the HD montage, we have um, currents entering consistently here in this area, the gray matrix versus here, we have currents entering on one side of the salty and um, moving on the other side of it. So, and obviously we might think that this will really make the uh, lot um, So one thing is that we can explore two strength, one parameter, but normal component might be also interesting because it, it gives us a very principled way of assessing the, um, the effect of the field orientation on the So just to repeat what I said already before, just now with the normal component. So here in this region, we have consistently um, the field entering the brain uh, across, uh, across all the areas, versus here we have this nice red, blue, red, blue, red, blue pattern, meaning that um, the currents enter in on one side and move on the other. I'm, I'm not sure that you really should expect similar physiological effects here, so um, also the current direction might really be of relevance. You just need to take this into account when you analyze And, um, well, there's some evidence that the normal component really might be interesting also to look at. Um, for example, here it was shown by Ilka Black, so that the electric field, the normal component, and the crown here were best the inter-individual inter inter differences in the two changes by TBCS. And in a similar way also here, it was that um, the normal component um, uh, really changed a lot here in the, in the area of the motor cortex. So the massage was changed. This all had two physiological differences. So all I want to advocate for this uh, um, is that um, basically field strength is so far shown um, quite often because it's easy to do, for example, and easy to understand, but um, I think also the remedy for difficult as already pointed also out in the prior talk. So from a more practical point of view, I think, well, we want to do um, analysis in standard spaces, for example, in an ice space, um, but I think what might be also quite interesting is to do uh, um, analysis on, on the surfaces. They have free surfer offers the which template, um, I think it has two advantages. First of all, it, it allows for quite accurate alignment of the individual cortical fields. And then you have a quite natural uh, way of defining and assessing normal and potential field components. Also, a surface-based analysis might be quite interesting. Obviously, MNI is easier, I think, because it's really easy to combine it, straightforward to combine it with a standard end style of my analysis. Yeah. That's, that's basically all I'd like to say um, here, and yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Axel. It was a really, really nice presentation, and it shows how kind of the, how much they will be have in the details of, of those uh, kind of uh, minor technical details that are going to be really important in terms of the, the question that we are exploring. That was great. So the next speaker would be Dario, so Dario would be following what, what Axel was talking about and the, kind of the, kind of the data that we have collected and the, the results that we have. Dario, let me just give you the, the screen, then you can present what you have. Now you can use your screen. Okay. Not sure. Is it working? We can see it really well. 
You can see the screen? Yes. Okay, okay so uh, thanks again uh, for the uh, invitation to present my work. I will talk about a recent study um, where we aim to link neurophysiological effects um, to electric fields. So, um, in this study, we applied intrascanner TDCS and within subject design of three conditions the novel, the photo, and sham TCS, and electric modules with PIC to modulate the activity of the sensory motor network. Um, we measured resting state, FMID, TDCS, and MRS before and um, afterwards. Resting state data was then used um, to quantify the coupling in the sensory motor network and the connectivity was the seat region and MRS data was used to quantify GABA and commit. And in the end, as Axel also already mentioned, we included two additional structural sequences that were optimized and uh, piloted before to give uh, uh, really good segmentations to do the computational head modeling um, and estimate the electric field distributions for each individual subject. Um, just briefly to give uh, a background on our initial idea, it was to um, improve understanding of TTCS, of course, as we all want, and so we decided to use a setup where we um, kind of knew what to expect, so at least from previous study, we predicted um, to observe reducing reduce or decreases in GABA and increases in sensory motor network strength. And um, so due to a normal TPCS, basically, and in addition, we were curious uh, whether we would observe the correlation between the individual decrease and increase um, on a neurophysiological level and with individually induced electric fields modeled using computational head model. More specifically, I wondered whether we could quantify the quality of actual simulation post hoc. Or in other words, maybe uh, OCT like question we all have has the teaching student done what he or she was supposed to do, or who else to blame for individual approach to see as effects. So, um, just briefly uh, on the neurophysiological level, we did find to use GABA um, due to a novel and the solar TDCS and uh, reduce beta made levels. Um, due to the photo to the CS. Resting state connectivity in the sensory motor network was increased during a model and the photo to the CS competition. We also did a scene based analysis with the seed in the precentral uh, gyrus, which is underneath the active electrode. We found increases in the left lateral and medial recentral gyrus and frontal clusters uh, due to normal TDCS and increases in the bilateral medial um, and postcentral and observatory regions. So most importantly in this study, um, we did electric field simulation. We modeled the actual configuration of the electrodes individually for each subject in each condition using photographs that were made in each session and rendering views then in the uh, MRI plot software. Um, to delineate the position and maybe the orientation that was uh, of the electrodes. Um, also, uh, Axel also mentioned this before, as the large sponsors in this classical montage um, do not touch uh, the forehead of the subject, uh, nearly in any subject, actually, we measured the length of the electrode touching the subject skin and used this for modeling. Um, uh, yeah, we used uh, Zimips. Uh, I can only recommend the new version that Axel and his colleagues could use. Um, and I'm happy that you give a little bit of introduction so I can go to the results. But you can see here. The average and the variation of the electric field in our study sample, um, maximum intensity cycle observed in frontal uh, regions and the lateral peak and post-central gyre with uh, the high variability here. 
looking at the normal component, which includes also the directional information, as we also showed this, so whether the brain goes into the cortex or out of the cortex, we can see uh, maximum um, values here in the central surface and also here in the uh, pre-central part in the left hemisphere. So we decided here, um, here to do a um, RI approach, selecting so three RIs in the vicinity of a stimulated area. Um, so one was around the main coordinate of the MIS voxel here, and one was in the center of, of the head block, and one was a so-called network cluster. Um, which responds to the coordinates of the region where we found the strongest uh, like. resting state connectivity effects. Um, comparing the electric field intensity, selective field strength was higher in the hand now, and the cluster where compared to the MRS, uh, MRI and normal components were highest. Um, were highest here in the cluster compared to the both hand knob and the MRS board. So finally, uh, these are the scatter plots showing the correlations between electric field strengths on the left here um, and the normal components on the right with individual GABA level modulation and individual um, sensory motor network strengths modulation which you are known to CS. So exploring the linkage between these, we found that uh, a significant positive correlation between the electric fields and the network cluster and the individual modulation of GABA. So the higher the electric field intensity, the higher the GABA reduction induced by a known GCS, and likewise the um, higher the electric field intensity here and the normal component, the higher the increase in the sensory motor network strength used by our novelties, yes. So basically, um, we observed a link between individual current field intensities and the active electrodes and many physiological effects of TCS in the study. And most importantly, I think we show that there is a variability um, in induced electric fields that probably are related to the variability in the physiological effects. And uh, just to show some example, I'll go beyond the ROI-based um, variability. These are the distributions of the electric fields in each of the subjects that are included in uh, the study, so from 1 to 24. And uh, as I mentioned, we recorded the exact electrode positions here and orientation to each subject and modeled this for the anode and for the cathode. Condition, and you can already here see that uh, when I go back and forth with the slides, that there is also an intra individual variability. So, not only that the um, fields are different uh, despite the same age electric modules between the subject, there are also differences when we vary the electrodes um, from the anodal and solar condition um, in terms of the fields. Sorry. So if you pay attention here to subject four, for example, um, but also you can see that between subjects, uh, just a strong variability, either the whole left hemisphere has high field intensities, and either it's a bilateral pattern or a more unilateral pattern. Um, these are just some uh, example data um, here. Um, when we use the rendering views and then uh, what's this results of the use of the electric field. Um, so here you can see the anode and the disorder condition are in the same subject. You see that here the electrode was um, a little bit higher, maybe due to a drift in the scanner. The subjects were like two hours, two and a half hours in the scanner, uh, maybe a little mispositioning in one or the other case. But um, the result is that um, we have a different distribution, which is um, more or less extreme, depending on how it varies. But here you see the really small variation um, of the electrode position, but 
that um, it's slightly different here. It's between the pentagon area, high intensity sphere, low intensity sphere, and also in other regions. So, um, in, in my opinion, this points uh, to the point is to interpret um, single or is based on um, single individual images with care. Um, to include also structural sequences optimized for head model generation. This is what Axel uh, described to model individual configurations, which are ideally reported also um, during the simulation setup. And um, if uh, electric field uh, intensity is estimated by computational head modeling, um, explain variability into the CS effects. This could be then included as looping variables, for example, or as covariates, and maybe um, it is also possible to predict uh, effects on behavior or function. Um, yeah, this is my last slide. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daria. It was a really, really nice presentation. Thank you. So, we have time for a few questions, but we, as we are going to have discussions at the end, and we have just one remaining speaker, so that would be nice if we move forward for the next speaker, who is going to be uh, Florian, and then we will move forward for basically the discussion and, and asking questions from, from speakers. So Florian, let me just give you the screen, just a moment. Okay, you can use the screen right now, Florian. Okay, um, can, can you see the screen already? Really well. Okay. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to show goes kind of into the, uh, the similar direction of uh, what we already heard from Daria. Um, but in, in our case, since we are interested in transcranial alternating current stimulation, um, maybe we can look at it from different um, stimulation modality. Um, yeah, so with, with TACS, we're, we're trying to modulate um, brain oscillations by, by, by usually sinusoidal currents um, with the aim to synchronize endogenous brain oscillations. Um, and for the synchronization, there, there is a lot of evidence from animal modeling um, in humans. However, there is not so clear direct ever evidence for the mechanism. Um, what we, however, see very often are these um, after effects, um, especially in the al Alcoban band, they're pretty well documented and replicated several times. Um, so we see an increase in power in the stimulated um, frequency band. Um, and we have shown that this increase lasts for at least um, one hour uh, when we apply TACS for 20 minutes. Um, and we have, of course, similar concerns about the method in terms of um, sometimes effects do not replicate, um, effect sizes are small, um, and also very recently um, there could be um, a chance that, that the underlying mechanism of stimulation could actually be explained by peripheral mm -hmm. effects, for example, stimulation of um, transcutaneous nerves or, or um, the flickering sen sensation that you have due to polarization of the retina. Um, in terms of, um, we, we have talked a lot about um, how much of the variability might be explained by individual anatomy. Um, so our question was actually to to test whether we can predict our TACS after effects in the alpha band um, from these individual uh, from individual simulations of the electric field. Um, and here we, we did not take um, an RI approach, but we are rather splitting up these, these uh, things into different compartments. Um, so um, we have something like, like, like a precision aspect. How well does the electric field overlap with our um, with, with the source uh, localized um, alpha oscillations? Um, and on the other hand, um, we, we thought it would be a good idea to have a strength parameter. We're just seeing what, what's the maximum current um, that is arriving in the brain. 
Um, and finally, since um, TACS is something that, that has frequency dependence, we also check whether um, a mismatch between the frequency that we're actually stimulating um, and the dominant frequency um, before stimulation um, also um, has a, plays a role in, in modeling our effects. Um, and as, as our statistic hypothesis, we first did a, a classic analysis where you just compared group means um, compared to a sham group, and then of course we, we tested whether we can predict our stimulation effect with the above model. Um, we did not use fMRI or MRI. We, we were doing this study in the MEG, um, and we recorded 40 participants there. Um, they we, we did a uh, little determination of their individual frequency um, on a three-minute resting state recording um, before the actual main experiment. Um, then we recorded MEG for 10 minutes before stimulation. Then we applied stimulation for 20 minutes, and then we recorded um, post MEG another 10 minutes thereafter. Um, during that, uh, participant had, participants had to do this very boring task that you see down there. Basically, they were staring at a at a fixation cross that would rotate approximately once in a minute, and they had to re react with a with a button press there. Um, that was just to to um, make sure people remain attentive and uh, especially keep their eyes open um, because that can fundamentally change um, the, the upper oscillations. Um, along with the MEG, we reported um, a structural MRI um, and um, analysis was done in, in the frequency domain um, and uh, these frequency domain data on the sensor level were then source projected using um, dynamic imaging of current sources informer um, and we did individual simulation of the current flow for each participant um, using the rows toolbox. Um, of course, when you, when you do these uh, simulations, you get a rather complex um, result with, with uh, many electric field values for each um, voxel in the brain, essentially. Um, so we have to break this down a little bit to, to have um, actual um, measures of what I would call successful TACS targeting. Um, as I've said already, there, there is something like a, um, a spatial component to how well does the electric field overlap um, with the brain activity that we're targeting. And for that purpose, we computed the spatial correlation between um, the electric field that you could see uh, in, at the down right um, with the source projected upper um, activity that you can see down here. And so they are very similar. There should be a voxel wise um, correlation between the two. So if we have a high correlation with, with spatial precision. Um, and the other question is, how strong are we stimulating? And for that purpose, we uh, just extract, we search for the 10,000 voxels, the um, highest um, electric field magnitude inside the gray and white matter compartments, um, and set that into our model. Um, also, as I said, TACS is a, is a method where we have frequency dependence. Um, and so we also included this frequency mismatch um, I, I said earlier that we are estimating um, the individual alpha frequency beforehand, um, but as it turns out um, in several studies that we did, and there's, uh, uh, we, we often not, we still um, get some frequency mismatch. Uh, there, there are recent studies um, nicely showing that there are some, some drifts in alpha frequency with time on tasks, um, and also before the actual experiment, of course, we are of not using the, the highest, sophistic, most sophisticated um, approaches for artifact cleaning um, and, and signal cleaning because um, uh, we, we kind of have to be quick in, in estimating the frequency. Um, so there, there in, in many cases, there are mismatches between the individual frequency before stimulation um, and the frequency that we're using for stimulation. So we also include this factor. Um, now, if we have a first look at, at the individual um, electric fields, there is not much surprise. Um, uh, there, there is a lot of variability. On the right, you can see um, the, the fields for the different subjects, and I think with the, with the blink of an eye, you can see that there, are, there is quite a lot of variability in terms of, of um, field strength, but also um, there are differences in, in the topographies. 
Um, and what, what is um, most important for us probably is uh, to, to briefly characterize the correlation with our, our individual alpha topography um, that was only moderate in, in this case and also for some subjects. Um, there is actually not much overlap between our, our stimulation um, in the electric field and um, the topography of, of um, the alpha oscillation. We then look at our traditional um, comparison of, of stimulation effects on the group level. Um, we see um, a, a stronger increase in alpha power in the, in the group that receives TACS as compared to sham. You can already see that in sensor level data. Um, what was kind of surprising was that um, the effect was rather widespread and, and not really focused. Uh, uh, localized um, in occipital cortex as we would have expected. Um, and also important, we do not see um, group differences in other frequency bands. Um, if we look at the, at the two stimulation groups, um, we do see that in both groups there is an increase in, in um, oscillatory power in the, on the source level. Um, again, quite striking is that in the TACS group, um, it's a lot more widespread um, than in the shared group. Um, um, probably most interesting to you now um, is that we, we now use the, we, we use the power increase within these two clusters. We thought this is the most fair comparison because if we, if we would have used a common cluster, um, probably we would have a little advantage um, in, in, in the TACS group, so in, in, in order to to bias our response variable a little bit more in favor of the sham group, um, we decided to use individual clusters. So these, these light up areas that we see here for the two groups were used um, to extract the, the power for, for the of the groups. Um, and now we, we use our, um, we, we fed our, our predictors that I've just explained um, into a regression analysis, analysis um, to predict the power increase within these two um, clusters. Um, and what we see is um, we, we get a significant model here um, that explains quite a lot of variance. Um, and we look at the single predictors, we see um, there's the, our, our measures of um, TACS targeting um, are explaining variability, but they're all interacting with, with the factor condition. Um, which, um, if you think about, of course, makes sense because we have one group that did not receive um, a, a stimulation that should be effective in modulating brain oscillations. Um, so the, it, we, we thought it's now, of course, most likely that, we, that the model only explains the data in, in the TACS group, which is why we see these, these interactions. So we fitted this model separately. Um, uh, pick out the condition factor um, and sort of fitted the model separately for the TACS and the sham group. And as we would expect, um, we see that only in the TACS group the model explains a quite huge proportion of the variance um, while it is not able to explain um, data of, of the group not receiving um, effective stimulation. Um, and here again, you see there are um, quite complex interactions um, that, that significantly predict our TACS effects between these different measures of um, uh, TACS targeting. Um, since we have this huge amount of uh, explained variance, um, we also did a, a, a leap one out cross validation. So we um, fit the model uh, based on, on 19 of these out of our 20 participants in the TACS group and try to predict the remaining data point. Um, and what we see there is um, our explained variance drops a little bit, but we're still um, explaining a solid amount of variance. Um, so to, to sum this up a bit, um, we, we see that we can replicate previously previous um, effects that we saw after TACS in the alpha band. Um, what was kind of surprising, and I think this, this is one of the, the, the few or uh, uh, studies that actually did source localization on the effect. Um, so this is also something 
we should um, uh, explore a bit more in the future, um, that these effects appear to be rather unfocused. Um, what was quite striking is that, that individual differences in the electric fields together with the frequency mismatch um, explain quite a huge amount of um, variability in the power increase that we see, um, which, which stresses the um, role of individual in, uh, um, anatomy. Um, but uh, also what, what should be kept in mind, of course, when we, when we compute these um, spatial correlations, um, there's also a chance, of course, that um, there are some participants that do not show such a clear um, alpha topography or, or kind of differ in, in, in terms of um, the, the spatial pattern of their um, alpha topography compared to other participants. Um, for example, it, it seems like there are four to five subjects that show rather something that, that uh, has um, motor areas involved, um, which could be something like dominant new power, maybe. Um, what is important is when, when I exclude these subjects from the analysis, um, still we, we, um, we're able to predict the power increase with our measures. Um, and what I find quite fascinating um, about these things, what I thought might be interesting to share with you, is that um, what, what benefits we might be able to gain um, if we in, uh, integrate um, our uh, electric field modeling in, in statistical analysis. Um, because we're, we're much, I think we're much closer to the, to the actual underlying mechanisms um, because we can feed in a dose response relationship, um, which does not assume as we do in, in a conventional t-test that there is a consistent effect uh, on, on more or less um, all participants, but we're taking into account that there are participants that receive non-optimal stimulation um, and that therefore uh, these subjects may not um, respond that well to stimulation or do not show any effects at all. Um, so I tried to, to illustrate that a bit with the plot on the right. Um, it might be the case that we have something like a moderate stimulation effect um, or, or moderate differences between groups or non-significant differences between groups, but um, if we plug in um, uh, uh, some, some kind of dose-response relationship, we might see that the groups differ a lot in terms um, of this dose-response relationships, um, which might be give us a more sensitive test for, for stimulation effects. Um, the other thing that I find interesting is, um, especially for TACS, um, where, where there is um, concerns um, that effects might be driven by, by peripheral me mechanisms. Um, it's rather difficult to, to explain how peripheral mechanisms um, could explain those response relationships with our um, electric field models that are based on um, the current that is arriving inside the brain. Um, and of course, um, after all these results also emphasize um, that, that we might be able to increase the effects that we can see um, when we are individualizing um, stimulation parameters, montage um, intensities, um, and maybe also um, be, be more adaptive or improve our estimation of individual frequencies in case of TLCS. Yes. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you're interested in some more details, there is a preprint available. Um, yeah, and I'm open for discussions. Great. Thank you, Florian. It's, it's amazing. Uh, being able to explain 52% of the variance is going to be huge. That is, that is amazing. That, is, that was really, really nice. So now we have time for questions from speakers. Just to make things easier, those who are going to ask a question, they need to kind of open their, their video and just do something like shaking their hand. Just let me just... Uh, be able to kind of get sure that everybody would be able to ask their questions. So if there is any question from a speaker, from the first speaker to the last, the, the panel is open for discussion, right, for, for, for questions. Any question? Okay, Johannes. Um. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. So, um, thanks to all the speakers for those very um, impressive talks. Um, 
from, especially I think from Axel's talk, I got the impression that you, um, we have lots of variance in like the, the the technical side of setting up our experiment. Um, and as one of the things that he said was we should try to be more accurate in electrode positioning, I had the idea that for that we actually need like individual um, neural navigation and or something like that. I would like to know from from Axel what how he thinks we could we could improve on that. And if I can add one more tiny thing, um, I would like to propose for the for the final uh, for the for the consensus paper that we may try to figure out together what is the most optimal way of doing um, a TES experiment um, and try to figure out what happens if we're not reaching that optimal state. So maybe I just answer um, on the electrode position. And I think for this specific audience, it's actually not so difficult because you do MRI and you see the electrodes or the gel at least on the MRIs. Um, so I would just suggest that you actually set up a structural sequence um, which you acquire in addition to your functional MRI um, with the electrodes on the head. And it doesn't have to be the full structural sequence that you need for building your head model. Um, you can also uh, use a, a speeded up sequence with, with a lower resolution. You will still be able to accurately localize your, your electrodes those. I think that's actually then even more accurate that, than what you can use with a neural navigation. So I hope that, that answers your question a little bit. No, not really, because that's post hoc. That's what we can do after we've actually positioned uh -huh. the electrode, right? Okay. Yes. While, while we are setting the electrodes on the subject's head, we need to have neural navigation or something like that. Yeah, I agree on your point. So um, it's a good source of control. So in terms of exploring what the effects of the two distances are on the outcome. Um, there we can then take it into account, but in order to specify um, the application, um, it would need a neural navigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and regarding the question of kind of uh, electrode positioning, do we have any comment from other speakers or other colleagues in the, in the room? I had a quick follow-up question um, with regards to acquiring a structural scan um, with the electrodes on. Um, is there a problem with just acquiring your, you know, your standard MP range with the electrodes on? Why would you need to acquire an additional um, structural ah, okay. sequence? Yes. So, um, so the clear MP range works. Um, I recommend also to acquire and integrate without the electrodes on, because otherwise, when you look at the electrodes, you will have a, an artificial bump of skin uh, where your electrodes have been. And um, this just is then uh, making your head body of this bike incorrect and completely But do you think that would affect like your segmentation? I mean, surely it would just be, you know, not not taken as part of the, um, the, the tissue probability map. No, I think everything which is just somehow on the head will be by at the moment at least at, at the long yeah. shape. So when you look at the head model, it will be much better than there. So I think it's a good idea to acquire um, the uh, special scan without the input. It's just time. <laughs> But that's why I said the 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 and the electrode doesn't have to have the full quality. You can really scale it down so that it runs in the most right? Yeah, I, I was just thinking in terms of my scanner time. I was planning to acquire my structure with the electrodes on. Yeah. But you think it's you yeah. think it's it's going to be a serious problem for the reconstruction of the structural yeah. image or segmentation of the structural yeah. image? Well, you can test it out yourself. I mean, it might also depend a little bit on the input that you're using. But what you saw yeah. that you can really nicely see them as, as thin, thin bars. Oh, yeah, I have, yeah, I, I have seen them, but I, but I just assumed that this wouldn't be a problem for when you were then, you know, doing an analysis where you segment your, your brain to normalize. 
any other idea or comments okay. regarding the electoral positioning and the discussion that we had right now? I think, you know, Marum, please go ahead. Just, just as far as the penalty of, of like gel smearing and other things, one interesting, you know, if the if the gel has the same conductivity as skin, which is the case for things like pens and other things that people are using, it, it potentially has zero impact on current flow, which is interesting. I mean, you, you're kind of smearing it because it's, it's just like having more skin, right? You're just smearing it all over. Well, if you're using saline and that's dripping or drying out, the penalty is extreme. And so again, whether you're using pads with paste or whether you're using HD with paste, and so also as far as segmentation errors. It may be that if the automatic segmentation mistakes paste for skin, it, maybe the penalty isn't so severe. I, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just putting that out there as, a, as an idea. Yeah, okay. I, can see that. I mean, what we saw is really extremely thin, thin um, from, from classical um, pad uh, um, sponge contagious because sponge and water soak. Um, um, this is a wonderful contrast, and AGMR and the stuff that is taking the skin, so then you suddenly have one centimeter more skin. And then you try to model your electrode on the top, and I think that's probably not a good I think it really depends on the uh, in your particular case, and you might want to just take it. I would have a question to Axel. Uh, before uh, Agnes, before 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 going to that, Yurani, you are you are going to make a question. And and uh, Alexander, are you going to make a discussion about yeah, the, the same I topic? To comment Please. Comment on, on on the electro accuracy. I mean, so we use like new navigation system. Also, if you have like repeat sessions, we're gonna make sure that you place those electrodes kind of at the same location uh, that you had, like say a, a week before, or two weeks. I think that is you can do with a new navigation system really nicely. I mean, sometimes it's not always possible. So if you work with patients, um, you don't have a lot of time, and sometimes you can do a photograph and try try to reconstruct that. Um, but also one thing that you can do is say you have like somewhat an uncertainty in, in the electrode location, so they can like just in the model maybe somewhat move the electrodes a little bit around and can see how strongly would your you know. Your model um, modeling results change um, with say with the uncertainty in, in the location. Say okay, even if even if it's somewhat inaccurate, um, you know our electric field would not change so dramatically. You see, like okay, this is a relatively robust uh, simulation that will also give you some more some more confidence in those things. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice. Any other any other comment and suggestion for the for the electrode? Okay, Yurani, just, please. Just maybe a very sure. small uh, comment on, on this. So we built, um, together with EasyCap, one cap where we mark the position of the electrodes so that we can use it in a roughly non-repeated manner. So I can maybe turn around this, uh, this picture of it. Yurani, your question. Yes, uh, so it's a bit related also to the electro uh, positioning, and I'm mainly interested in using the HEP model for uh, uh, optimizing my simulation protocols. So not only in terms of where I want to put my electrodes, but also in terms of uh, how uh, much current I want to apply or something like that. So my question is more whether that's something that is already on the way to be implemented in CINIT, for example, or in ROST, or if someone has uh, done something similar already, or... I think it's maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, Marum, I go first and then you, you answer for, for Rose. I think it depends a little bit on what you, of, of what you want to do exactly. So, I mean, and you want to keep the electrode position fixed and just make sure that the same amount of current strength enters the brain. That you can do already now with, with the simulation because, uh, I mean, it's a linear scaling between two strength and, and input current. So, um, in order, you can just basically compare the fields to the simulated, let's say, for one milliampere in the target area, and you see, okay, in this subject, it's now 50% lower than what I want. So, I would then increase my current in relative by 50% to 1.5 milliampere. That would, would, in theory, equalize then the, um, 
um, the neutron strength in the brain. I say in theory because all these simulations have some uncertainty, and uh, um, so that that will work out to some extent, but not fully. Agnes, Marum, Marum, do you do you want yeah. to add anything on that? Um, yeah, I mean, like you know, I think I also said the brain it's linear. So I mean, you, there there is an approach, obviously, where you pick an ROI and it describes any montage, right? And it gives you the montage to produce the, to, to optimize current delivery or locality for that. That's one That's one goal. Another goal, like Axel just said, is just that you want to produce the same electric field in every subject. Uh, and then you don't necessarily need uh, optimization because things scale linearly. The one caveat to that I would point out is if you're using pads, then the peak is not under, under any pad. And the peak is actually moving, right? It's, it's going to be different on every subject. And so when you're using large pads, um, it's a little bit more complicated. What are you normalizing to? Are you just picking one ROI and giving everyone the same electric field in that ROI, but it's completely wild outside those ROIs. And you can, in fact, increase the variability in other ROIs. And so that gets into this. So again, when you're using pads, I don't, I think that compromises what it even means to, often, to normalize to, to begin with. Agnes. Yeah, um, so great talks from Axel and uh, Marom. I was just wondering, um, also as a suggestion to the um, consensus paper, when you model, or most of the modeling that has been done is more retrospectively, and you can tell the experimenter what probably worked well and what, and what did not work well, and if there's some explanation of variability. But would you also like to use the experimental data to fine tune the models? Um, I mean, you, you already said there's some uncertainty in the models as such, and a lot of assumptions. Wouldn't it be worthwhile to prospectively have, for example, one subject where you know very well um, what's the response, for example, to a certain type of um, TDCS is, to a normal TDCS? Um, there are some subjects like this where you always have this one milliamp, a certain um, increase in MEP size and so on. And you would systematically very um, experimentally the strength of stimulation, also the electrode positions, um, assume that as a ground truth in a way, and then see what your model does with um, those variations, and then be willing kind of to um, yeah to fine tune the, the modeling. Is that possible, or is it not something um, that you think is feasible? But I go first again, and Barry, you then head on, maybe. Um, so I think um, in terms of model validation, I think there are two, two different aspects here. The one is, is really uh, how well that the models predict the current flow. And I wouldn't use MRI or any physiological loop out as my primary um, approach to test that. I would rather um, use direct recordings, independent recordings, of the group as, as such, or methods like MRIIT, which we're working on. But this is then a direct measurement of the quantity which I want to test. Um, like, a, so like a mechanical model, in a way. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. What we're doing is a current flow model, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's it. And we want to just validate them basically that the groups are really fully close to the real one. And then what we look at from my eye and also other physiological outcome measures is the yeah, physiology. And there, um, as already Marom's uh, um, initial thought, very nicely shown, um, is that there are a lot of, uh, or seen up basically, um, there, there are a lot of additional um, factors which also influence the variability. And it's also then how basically the fields really couple or change fuel activity. So I think this is a much more complex scenario. And um, I wouldn't really like to try to tweak our models, which are current flow models, to explain that best. Uh, because we can only make the current flow models accurate or not. Um, the, the next thing is then rather to understand how to best interpret the current flow and how to best use that information and um, um, to inform basically um, our logical interpretation. Yeah. Yes, true. Maybe then you wouldn't actually change your model or fine tune the model, but you could have like a systematic evaluation with the current flow that you predict, with the kind of known 
um, parameters and the known physiological response and to see how this interacts so that the experimenter has an idea how much your model with the, with the injected field for example um, will actually tell him about, um, yeah, yeah, about is, physi physiology. Yeah, yeah, and that's absolutely what, what, is, what is needed I think. I just want to point out that there, from a strict point of view a model validation using physiological data is just not possible because model predicts not physiological responses but but a uh, uh, entity, and um, I think this just is then two steps. We're talking about two steps here in a way. Both are really important uh, to do, uh, but we should maybe not mix them up. You know, I I, I don't want to have much to add. I, I do want to. I mean, obviously, I think Florian gave a talk where he, he tries to get into linking, you know, functional outcomes with with current flow. Uh, we also have Dr. Harada here, and he's he's probably had done more work than anybody on individualized modeling and using that to explain data. But I I, I think Dr. Harada, most of your work has also been sort of retrospective uh, and, and trying to correlate it. And um, your point is very good. I, there's been um, there's been much less prospective data, and, and I haven't seen as much work on on really trying to. Um, uh, what Axel just said, these, these models that lack a functional, the current flow models lack a functional component. It just stops with electric field. And it, it has to be so much more complicated than that. And I think what you're suggesting is to, is to uh, you know, in a more um, humble way, just look at all the functional data that's coming out and correlate this functional data with current flow data and see if we can generate models that maybe then make functional predictions. Um, yeah, more like neural networks because those people... Um, that try to predict um, something, for example, stimulation within um, artificial neural networks. Of course, they use the experimental data, but maybe it's not something you actually plan to do. You kind of want to um, stay with the electrical field injection and leave the neural networks to the next experimenter. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, I would think you have to integ um, um, yeah, integrate the, the, um, the data from the, or the empirical data. You really want to say something about the neural network level? Mm. Sure, but what you're basically then suggesting is to add basically different modeling approaches together, um, which is interesting but also challenging because each of these um, have their own limitations and challenges. So um, it, it's very interesting, and it was a little bit brought up in, in, in um, um, Synapse um, report already, um, but it's. I think we, it will be a violent error approach, I think, to a certain extent. So there we think how to and try to do it our best way, then we will fail to a certain extent and learn from that. And it's really a learning experience what, what's going on at the moment, um, how to use these models best and how, how much they really predict. And, and Alexander, are you going to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of picking up on on, the, on those points of the model uncertainty, and I think um, in all this really nice talk that have been all pointed out, I like those factors, and then, but one thing that hasn't really been um, stated so much is times of like accuracy of models predicting electric field strength, and you see all this nice correlation plot or regression line, but where you have on the x-axis have the electric field in any norm E, you know, you know, direction component, but basically what's not there is somewhat like an error bar of that estimate. And basically, I feel like if you add there like an error bar about the certainty of this predictive value, like your error bar would be longer than your x-axis. Like the error bar would probably be larger than the whole Indian pixel variability that you have between all, all your participants. And somehow, you know, you can you know, questions, uh, you know, what is like, say, the accuracy that you need in a model that such, you know, such a correlation or like regression gives, gives you a meaningful result is basically the error that is associated with, you know, the individual peak strengths, you know. But Alex, could, could we say, you know, we can, as long as the rank order stays the same, you might be okay, right? Yeah, so no, exactly, but I would not... Yeah, the, the rank order would be fine, but we also don't know that either. I would, I would argue, right? I mean, if 
you know, if you say say the model predicts 0.3, the actual feature might be like 0.1 to 0.5. That's you know what I you know I would maybe say from from our measurement results. And even if in for that range, the rank order could still you know could still change. I think. So I think we're just not like fully there yet. As maybe something that you or Axel or others, you know, maybe can would be curious to hear their opinions. You know, there's been a lot of work on current flow validation and electric field validation, and I would say for all the unknowns, this field has been, that's been fleshed out over, you know, a couple of decades now with some convergence. And there's a catastrophic lack of mapping that to functional changes. We're asking how, we're asking how baseline brain state affects what electric field does or networks. So I'm, I'm kind of with you, Alex, that there's, there's work to be done there, but it feels like there we're building on a foundation while going from electric, you know, these false color electric field maps to predictions of functional changes, never mind in a network, I feel like we are pretty ground level there. Again, Corey and other people, we, we, we've heard work on this topic, but I, I, um, I don't feel we're so sophisticated there. Dr. Hirata, do you want to add anything to that? This is a conference place, it is so noisy, I do not hear everything. So basically, the, it is very easy to emphasize the uncertainty of the current in the brain. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, as compared with the other tissues, the brain conductivity is rather stable, at least reported until now. So the, it's just my feeling, but uh, as compared with our results and other research groups, basically, in good agreement. So from that uh, available data, maybe we have to try to compare with measured uh, phenomena. And as already discussed, the first one is the uh, model segmentation. It actually, I am a, basically the expert of human safety from electromagnetic field. Now I have been uh, attending the conference. At the community, the same discussion uh, actually there exists. The model segmentation itself is a large error, maybe at, uh, maybe 20 percent, 30 percent or more. Then maybe we have to evaluate the electric field. If the electric uh, conductivity is fixed, the error is not so large. It's just my feeling. Then the physiological response is uh, actually the uh, for TACS. It may depend on the uh, frequency for synaptic effect. So all the uh, uh, components should be. Uh, actually combined to discuss further to for uh, comparing with FMR. So uh, it's uh, actually my summary, and I'm unsure. Yeah. Axel. Yeah, I just want to add to that. So I think um, Alex certainly has a point, but I, I think also Marum has a point in that he says, okay, as long as the order effects are fine, you can start making uh, these comparisons. I think um, I agree that the, the computational models have been improved over the last decades, um, or so maybe best in certain sense we have more accurate numerical methods. Um, what is still um, to be done, I think, is still work on uh, segmentation robustness. Um, then the other thing is um, we don't know the system on the activities with high certainty, that's another thing. Um, and obviously that's why I'm very interested in, in um, uh, really physical measurements um, to, to get those uh, better. But still, I think we're at a position where we can start making um, comparisons with physiology because that's what we want to do at the end. I just want to add one thing. Um, I mean, um, order effects, as said by Marum, they stay, they stay the same across subjects as long as the subject group is quite homogeneous. I think um, when you have, for example, um, especially aging populations, um, the scale of connectivity uh, of very young and very old might really differ a lot. And suddenly, um, there's, there's an parameter in the model that we don't take into account so far. So I think um, this is just something to keep in mind. So as long as you have a homogeneous subject group, um, I, I'm relatively confident that order effects stay in place. When it gets more heterogeneous, I'm not too sure anymore. But that's interesting to explore, actually. Any other comment or suggestion? I'm, I'm very 
curious if you know if you if for any outcome measure if you've got ten subjects and you scan you know their functional state initially and their anatomical state initially if anybody would be able to rank their sensitivity to an intervention you know prospectively and again I know Dr. Dorado has worked on this and we've heard stuff like before and doing this retrospectively but I that would be a very impressive piece of software where again you could take ten people and do whatever you want to them, baseline measures, and then rank how much they would respond. And that, you know, that's a high bar, you know, for TDCS and for TACS. I would argue that does not exist for, for TMS and for ECT and for DBS also, where you can do it sort of so prospectively. But um, I just want I, I wanted to put that maybe someone can point say I'm wrong and, and they can do this, but I'm not I'm not sure. Alexander. Yeah, I think um, then also in terms of like what following up, what is like a number of participants if you need for those predictions, and then yeah. you have all those you know all those choices of you know analysis you can do. You can do whole brain. You choose an RI. You can choose like all those different three components. And so in some way you maybe have to be more stringent with the statistics. Some are coming like from the fMRI. You know, field how, how that has um, evolved over over time. Let's say, oh, you know, we choose a, like a small ROI and then find this correlation, and that's how we then build build our paper and have have a nice story. But in, in some way, just the degrees of freedom of you know statistical models you can try are basically almost infinite. And so I think there has to then also be cautious to say, okay. I think for exploratory analysis, I think that's all great and fine. Say, okay, this has been exploratory, but in some way, then also see, okay, can we then confirm or also replicate those studies? Or can we pull that across across a large larger n? I think if you now do an fMRI study and have now your 10, 15 participants, you cannot publish that anymore in, in, in a decent in a decent journal. But they're like in brain simulation, still like they're okay. We do like 15, 20. Um, you know, participants and to publish that in your image of brain stimulation, for example. So I was wondering also, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? What is like kind of minimum number of participants um, to have that such analysis actually also, you know, can, can make sense? Bernard? Yeah. Um, I guess we, we could think about implementing a resting scan at the beginning of all fMRI studies as a collaborative effort. I was planning to do that for my upcoming study. Um, it's just going to be 24 people. But, I mean, if, if more people were doing that, then we could, you know, when we have when we have similar montages, we could compare um, initial functional brain states as well as using the structural stuff. Yeah, Mario, that, that definitely is something that we are thinking about in a type of kind of collaborative network that we already have in terms of if there is any kind of potential that we can add something to the protocol that we are collecting and being able to share the data together in the future, seeing how we might be able to, to start with, I mean, you have mentioned that, that it could be really simple, let's say, resting a state fMRI protocol that could be easily done in different lab or be added to other studies that we are doing and see how we might be able to use that data. And there are also kind of available data in the field that people have collected before but they have never explored the, let's say, the computational head modeling part of that, and then we can kind of consider that as well. So that is something that I hope that we can do together in this network that we have. Bernard, do you have any question? You have got any question? Do you want to? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. So this is actually like a follow-up question or maybe comment on what um, Axel was raising before. Um, mentioning um, skull conductivity, changes in skull conductivity in aging populations, in, and that we have like a, to address this question also to to realistically realistically model electric field distributions. Um, so I think we need a solution for that, and I think um, it still might be hard to resolve that based on MRI, um, but still it's one of the most important problems when you want to apply to clinical populations, stroke patients, other kind of populations, because I think that's the target, the target of most of us to actually apply it to the clinics. 
So what, what possibilities do you see, Axel, to take this into account and to apply it more to clinics? Okay. So I, I think that uh, this uh, is quite an ambitious goal already, not only to find out how much variability there is in aging, which is the first question, but then already how to take it in clinics. I think it's a two-step uh, approach, basically, first to identify how large the things to be are and to support them. And that, I think, can be also a quite, quite um, comprehensive study because that doesn't have to be then in here um, towards clinical implementation. The second thing is, uh, like a clinical implementation, yes, I think there are things like the, um, um, the EIT, sorry, EIT, which works with electrodes on the head, like to measure the impedances of the, uh, of the issues. I think those could be potentially adapted um, to give you in individual um, conductivity estimates of the scale. And I think to have that really into a easy to do uh, solution, it has to be really integrated in some in commercial product, I think, so that you can really then roll it out in, in, in clinical life. So at the moment, I think there's still lack of knowledge. How much does it really vary across the age range? Um, there's a lack of methods how to access, assess it properly in, on an individual level. And then there's the, the implementation space and how to best bring it into a, a product. Mm -hmm. like that. that so, is good. Uh, I think it will, it will take a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. Marum, do you want to have any kind of concluding note? Anything that we kind of have as the, the last point? Uh, no, I'm, I was just, uh, I was really surprised at how much convergence there was among all the speakers about the kind of issues that we need to work on and where the unknowns are. Everyone's saying, um, how do you correlate electric fields with outcomes? And how do you, how do you consider individualization? And, um, really, Florian's point about ultimately increasing effect sizes. You know, really, which sort of the goal that we want to get to, either at the population level or at the individual level. So, I, I uh, for all the questions that were brought up, um, I want to recognize how much consensus there is on, on the kind of problems we need to be focusing on. Yep. Any other concluding note from speakers, Axel, others? Do you want to have any other last notes? Any other thing that people can like to add? Okay, great. So, we are. Uh, at the end of the, the, the second webinar. I hope that this webinar would help us to just get together and see what, I mean, we, what are the challenges that we have and how we might be able to work together to face those challenges in the next 10, the next 10 20 years ahead of us. And I hope that we can kind of find solutions in a collaborative way. So we will keep in touch and we'll have the third webinar on uh, September 26. I will send you the details about the, the third webinar and we will move forward together. Thank you very much for your attendance. We will, uh, I hope that you will have a really nice day. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Goodbye. 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 Bye.